What did I do? Hello. I'm sorry, I'm late. Um, I was, if it's any consolation, I was fiddling around with the stream settings. Um, you'll see later. Uh, we, <laughs> yeah, sorry, I got caught up doing something and I didn't realize what time it was because I was, I was really into getting done what I was trying to get done. I hope I got it done. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, we'll see. Um, but it'll be a quick mm -hmm. transition from the live to the game stream. Oh, hi, Toby. Tell Toby I say hi. Tell him he's a good boy. But I got my coffee. I got my water. We got a lot to go through today. So I'm a little sorry that I'm late because I, I, I just, I just got distracted. I was trying to do stuff. I, I, I didn't even fully get it accomplished, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. We've not. Hi. I was <laughs> Hello. There's people in here I've never seen before. That's neat. This, this live might not be what you think it is. <laughs> oh, thank you. I like this app. It's comfortable. I don't know. I'll probably get hot with all these lights on. There's too many lights. And I... I know we are. <laughs> I know we are. <laughs> I just don't often talk to anybody. <laughs> I, I don't know what to do when you become mutuals with people, so I don't do anything. <laughs> I'm like, I don't have anything necessary or important to say to this person that I uh, definitely like their work and appreciate what they do. And they already know that, obviously. That's why I followed them. Um, so no communication is necessary. And then I don't, I don't know what to say to anybody to become mutuals with. So I never talk to any of my mutuals. <laughs> Unless I've met you at a different place. <laughs> if we've met in person, I, t I talk to you. <laughs> But I never know what to do when I become mutuals with anybody, so I never talk to anyone. <laughs> and that is now something you know about me. I yeah, if anything, if I know they like cats, I send cat videos. If I if I don't know, I don't I don't contact them at all. I don't know what to do. So I never send anybody anything. <laughs> I've gotten some weirdly unhinged videos from some of my mutuals. See, I don't want to be the one person that is that sends you a really confusing video with no context. So I don't send you. Unless I know you're going to like it or I know you're going to appreciate it, I don't send anything. <laughs> I don't send shit. <laughs> I get a lot from you and Insomniac. I also get some from Diana, some from Ray, some from Crimson. I, I, get, it. I, get, I get videos from Everybody, <laughs> for cat videos. <laughs> Alright, well you like cat videos? <laughs> That's mainly what I deal in, is cat videos. <laughs> I, occasionally I know when someone's into like a cosplay thing and I'll send them that if I think they'll like it. But a lot of the times I, I don't like to... I don't, I don't send cosplayers videos of other cosplayers. Just as a general rule, one time I did that and I got responses I did not expect and then I stopped doing that. <laughs> Swiftblood, you're a mixed bag. Also, thank you, by the way. I didn't get a response, but Swiftblood sent me a really cool gift in my P.O. box. It's now my, like new favorite cup. It's tied with the Grandmaster Cup, in all honesty. I fucking love this cup. It's, a, it's an old advert for embalming fluid, which, phenomenal. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty sick cup. Um, and 
Dave wanted to let you know that he also likes his cup. It is from Halo 4, and it holds more than his original cup, which was all he said in the matter. Um, apart from thank you, but that equates to he really likes it, and he's been using it since he got it. So, I think it's his new favorite cup. Ah, oh, dang, I forgot my cat mug today. I made, um, a Nutella latte in my other cup. From Dave, it is high praise. It is high praise. <laughs> Which is not generally. He was he was like, why do they keep sending me stuff? They've never met me, and I'm like, I, they, I don't know. <laughs> they like you, dude. And he was like, I just come in and talk shit while you're playing video games. I don't do anything. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so he's more confused than anything, but he appreciates it nonetheless. Aw, oh, succulent cat. That's still cute. <laughs> he is hilariously awesome. He just doesn't know it yet. I know. I try reminding him of that. He's like, will you at least, like, talk and, and, like, do content? I don't do anything. And I'm like... <laughs> they like you. <laughs> I don't know. They like you. You're crazy. They like it. I don't... <laughs> You make them laugh, and that's that's it. That's it. <laughs> Alright, so... Last week, we started Map of Days. This week, we have about a 40-page chapter. I don't know if we're going to get through it all, because I was late. Sorry, once again. But we're gonna get as much done as we possibly can and if you're new here and don't often hang out in my lives uh, I just read you a book I read you a bedtime story I hope you like it we've been working our way through Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children uh, we are now on book four book four book four right that sounds wrong I mean, it's right but it's wrong right yeah it's right it just feels wrong. I don't know. Good damn. Four books in. Um, and yeah, I'm just like, that's wrong. And I'm like, no, it's right. It's book four. It's book four, man. Book four. Get your shit together. It's only the second chapter. I'll get used to saying it. But we're on book four, Map of Days. If you never read it, it's a great read. You can check it out. The author's Ransom Riggs. All the other books are on my YouTube. I do have to update chapter eight of the last book. I'm working on that. I got my recording space set up. I'm working on soundproofing it. You'll know when it happens. <laughs> You'll probably be able to hear the difference. Uh, hopefully, it'll pay off. It's, <laughs> there's dividends in that. Um, but we're on chapter two, and if you missed what happened last time, you didn't miss too much. It's just set dressing for the beginning of book four, uh, but mainly... Jacob was in a spot of trouble. He was about to be committed to inpatient therapy at some psych ward somewhere. And he was saved just in the nick of time by Miss Peregrine and all the peculiar children who came to visit because they hadn't heard from him in a while and wanted to see, well, their future, Jacob's present. Um, so they are now... Staying in Jacob's house, Jacob's parents have freaked out and have passed out in the garage because they got bombed with Mother Dust by Bronwyn when they tried to back through their own garage door. So this is uh, fun and definitely not problematic at all. <laughs> Who's ready for the rest? <laughs> I also really like stars. Sorry, that was a good username. Two. All right. It's just a happy good time. Here we go. I woke the next morning with a sour pit in my stomach, certain it had all been a dream. Stealing myself for disappointment, I ventured downstairs, half expecting to find my bags packed and my uncles once more guarding the doors against escape. 
Instead, I was greeted by a scene of peculiar domestic bliss. The hole downstairs was full of cheerful conversation and the warm smells of cooking food. Horace was banging around in the kitchen while Emma and Millard set the table. Miss Peregrine was whistling to herself and opening windows to let in a morning breeze. Outside, I could see Olive and Bronwyn and Claire chasing one another around the yard, Bronwyn catching Olive and tossing her twenty feet into the air, Olive laughing like mad as she fluttered down again at half speed, the weight of her shoes just enough to overcome her natural buoyancy. In the living room, Hugh and Enoch were glued to the television, watching a commercial for laundry detergent in rapt wonderment. It was a welcome sight, as I could have imagined it, and for a long moment I stood unnoticed at the bottom of the stairs, taking it in. In the space of a single night, my friends had managed to make my house a happier, cozier place than it had been in all the years I had lived here with my parents. Nice of you to join us, Miss Peregrine sang out, jolting me from my daydream. Emma rushed over to me. What's wrong? she said. Feeling dizzy again? Just appreciating the scenery, I said, and then I drew her close and kissed her. She slid her arms around me and kissed me back, and I was overwhelmed by a tingling warmth that flooded my brain and a sudden sensation of being out of my body, like I had floated up to the ceiling and was looking down on the soft, beautiful face of this amazing girl and my friends and the whole sweet scene, and I wondered how it was that such an exquisite moment had appeared in my life. The kiss ended too soon, but before anyone else in the room noticed it had happened, and we linked arms and walked toward the kitchen. How long has everyone been awake? I asked. Oh, for hours! Millard said, carrying a pan of biscuits toward the dining room. We're loop lagged rather terribly. He was wearing a full outfit, I noticed, plum colored pants, a light sweater, and a scarf around his neck. I dressed him this morning, Horace said, popping his head out of the kitchen. He's quite the blank slate, sartorially speaking. Horace himself was wearing an apron over a white-colored shirt, a tie, and pressed pants, which almost certainly meant he'd gotten up extra early just to iron his clothes. I excused myself and slipped away to check on my family in the garage. They were still asleep right where I'd left them. They'd hardly even shifted positions in the night. Then something unpleasant occurred to me, and I ran to the car and held my hands in front of each of their noses. When I was satisfied they were still alive, I went back to join my friends. Everyone was gathered around what my parents called the good table, a long slab of black glass in a rarely used formal dining room. It was a space I associated with stiff manners and unpleasant conversations because it was only used either when family came over on holidays or when my parents had something important to discuss with me, which usually meant a lecture about my grades, bad attitude, friendships or lack thereof, etc. So it was sweet to find the room filled with food and friends and laughter. I wedged myself into the seat next to Emma. Horace made a big show of unveiling the platters of food he'd prepared. This morning, we've got pain perdu, potatoes a la royale, a vinaigre of French pastries, and porridge with caramelized fruits. Horace, you've outdone yourself, said Bronwyn, her mouth already full. Plates were filled and thanks were given. I was so eager to eat that it was several minutes before I thought to ask where the groceries had come from. They may or may not have floated off the shelves of a market down the road, said Millard. 
I stopped mid chew. You stole all this? Millard, said Miss Peregrine, what if you had gotten caught? Impossible. I'm a master thief, he said. It's my third most impressive skill, after my extreme intelligence and near perfect memory. But they have cameras in, store in, in stores now, mm -hmm. I said. If they get you on video, it could be a big problem. Oh, said Millard. He seemed suddenly fascinated by the caramelized peach slice at the end of his fork. Very impressive thieving, said Enoch. What was your first most impressive skill again? Miss Peregrine put down her silverware and snapped her fingers. All right, children. We're adding stealing from normals to the mustn't ever list. Everyone groaned. I'm quite serious, Miss Peregrine said. If the police were to pay us a visit, it would be no small inconvenience. Enoch slumped dramatically in his chair. The president is so tiresome. Remember how easy these things were to sort out in the loop? He drew a line across his throat. <coughs> Goodbye, trouble mortal. We're not on can home anymore, Miss Peregrine said. And this isn't a game of Raid the Village. The actions you take here have real and permanent consequences. I was only kidding, Enoch grumbled. No, you weren't, Bronwyn hissed. Miss Peregrine held up her hand for silence. What's the new rule? Mustn't steal, the kids chorused unenthusiastically. And? A few seconds passed. The headmistress frowned. Mustn't kill normals? Olive ventured. That's right. There will be no killing of anyone in the present. <laughs> what if they're really annoying? Asked Hugh. No matter. You may not kill them. Without permission from you, said Claire. No, Claire, said Miss Peregrine sharply. Mm -hmm. No killing at all. Oh, all right, said Claire. It might have been chilling talk had I not known them so well. Still, it was a stark reminder of how much they had to learn about life in the present, which reminded me. When should we start these normaling lessons? I asked. How about today? Emma said eagerly. Right now, said Bronwyn. Uh, what should I start with? What do you want to know? Why don't you fill in our knowledge of the past 75 years or so? Said Millard. History, politics, music, popular culture, recent breakthroughs in science, technology, I was thinking more along the lines of learning to talk like you're not from 1940 and crossing the street without being killed. I suppose that's important too, said Millard. I just want to go outside, said Bronwyn. We've been here since yesterday, and all we've done so far is muck through a stinky swamp and ride a bus at night. Yeah, said Olive. I want to see an American city, and a municipal airport, and a pencil factory. I read a fascinating book about pencil factories. No, no, said Miss Peregrine. We're not going on any grand expeditions today. So just get that right out of your minds. We've got to walk before we can run, and given our limited transportation options, a walk sounds just about right. Mr. Portman, is there an underpopulated place we can preambulate that's proximate to here? I don't want the children interacting 
with normals unnecessarily before they've had more practice. There's the beach, I said. It's pretty dead in the summertime. Perfect, said Miss Peregrine. She sent the kids off to change. I want to see sun protection, she called after them. Hats, parasols. I was about to go and change, too, when I felt the dread return. What do we do about my family? I asked her. They were dosed with enough dust to keep them sleeping into the afternoon, she said. But just in case, we'll post someone here to keep watch over them. Okay, but then what? You mean after they wake? Yeah, how am I supposed to explain you? She smiled. That, Mr. Portman, is entirely your decision. But if you like, we can talk strategy as we walk. I gave my friends permission to raid the closets for beach-appropriate clothing, since they had none, and it was truly strange to see them return a few minutes later dressed in something like modern outfits. Nothing fit Olive or Claire, so they added floppy sun hats and dark glasses to what they were already wearing, which made them look like celebrities trying to dodge paparazzi. Millard wore nothing at all save a slather of sunscreen across his face and shoulders, which turned him into a sort of walking blur. Bronwyn had on a floral top and slouchy linen pants. Enoch had snagged some swim shorts and an old t-shirt. And Horace looked downright preppy in a blue polo and a pair of khaki chinos, cuffs neatly rolled. The only one who hadn't changed was Hugh still moody and moping. He had volunteered to stay behind and watch over my parents. I gave him my uncle's phone, pulled up my own cell number on the screen, and showed him how to call me in case they started waking up. Miss Peregrine came into the room, and everyone oohed and awed. She wore a fringed top with scooped-out shoulders, topical, tropical print capri pants, aviator sunglasses, and her perpetually unswept hair towered through the middle of a pink plastic sun visor. It was slightly disconcerting to see her dressed in my mom's clothes, but she looked absolutely normal, which was, I suppose, the point. You look so modern, Olive cooed. And strange, said Enoch, wrinkling his nose. We must be masters of disguise if we're to pass in different worlds, Miss Peregrine said. Careful, Miss P. All the bachelors will be after you, Emma said as she walked in. You're one to talk, Bronwyn said. Woo, look out, boys. I turned to her and the breath caught in my throat. She wore a one-piece swim dress with a skirt bottom that, stooped, that stopped mid-thigh. It was far from scandalous, but easily the most revealing thing I'd ever seen her wear. She had legs. I'd known it since the moment I met her. But Emma Bloom was achingly pretty, and I had to make a conscious effort not to stare. Oh, hush, Emma said, and then she caught me looking and smiled. That smile? My God, it lit me up from the inside. Mr. Portman, I turned to face Miss Peregrine, my dopey grin melting. Uh, uh, yeah. Are you ready, or have you been entirely incapacitated? No, I'm good. I'll bet you are. Enoch said with a snicker. I knocked him with my shoulder as I parted the crowd, and then I threw open the front door and led my peculiar friends out into the world. 
I lived on a skinny barrier island called Needle Key. Five miles of touristy bars and waterfront houses with a bridge at each end bisected by a winding lane overhung with banyan trees. It only qualified as an island thanks to a long ditch of water that separated us from the mainland by about a thousand feet, which at low tide you could cross without getting your shirt wet. Rich people's houses fronted the gulf. The rest of us looked out on Lemon Bay, which on quiet mornings was really very nice, with sailboats drifting by and herons fishing for their breakfast along the banks. It was a safe and sweet place to grow up, and I probably should have been more grateful. But I had spent my youth fighting the sensation, creeping at first, then overwhelming, that I belonged elsewhere. That my brain had begun to melt, and that if I stayed here, a day past graduation, it would liquefy entirely and run out of my ears. Yeah. Yeah, they have the zoomies. They keep launching themselves at the closed door. <laughs> For real. You can't own a grocery store chain and then be like, or... No, shut up. <laughs> I kept us hidden behind a thicket of hedge at the end of my driveway until all the cars within hearing range had passed, and then we darted across the street to a footpath, intentionally neglected and overgrown, with mangroves so tourists couldn't find it. After a minute or two of bushwhacking, the path broke open onto Needle Key's main attraction, a long white sand beach in the gulf, emerald green and spreading out endlessly. That's true. That's true. I agree with you. I heard a few gasps escape my friends. They had seen beaches before, had lived on an island for most of their unnaturally long lives, but they'd rarely seen one so pretty, with water as flat and calm as a lake an apron of powdery white sand that curved away gently, fringed palms waving. This pristine view was the entire reason some 20,000 souls lived in an otherwise nowhere town, and in moments like this, with the sun high in the sky and an easy breeze chasing away the heat, you couldn't fault them their choice. Goodness, Jacob, said Miss Peregrine, taking in a lungful of air. What a little paradise you have here. Is that the Pacific? asked Claire. Enoch snorted. It's the Gulf of Mexico. The Pacific's on the opposite end of the continent. We strolled along the beach, the smaller kids circling us as they ran to collect shells, the rest just enjoying the view in the sunshine. I slowed to match Emma's stride and took her hand. She glanced at me and smiled, and we both sighed at the same time then laughed. We talked for a while about the beach and how pretty it all was, a topic that was quickly exhausted, and then I asked the group about how life in Devil's Acre had been for them. I had only heard about their trips outside the acre via the Panalupticon, but surely they had done more than travel. Travel is crucial to one's development, said Miss Peregrine, her tone strangely defensive. Until they have traveled, even the most educated person is ignorant. It's important that children learn that our society is not the center of the peculiar universe. Aside from these occasional field trips, Miss Peregrine explained that she and the other Imbrins had made a mighty effort to create a stable environment for their wards. Like my friends, most had been torn away from the loops where they'd lived much of their lives. In some cases, those loops were now collapsed, gone forever. Many had lost friends in the hollow gas raids, been injured, or endure, endured other traumas. And though Devil's Acre, with its filth and chaos and its history as the center of Call's evil empire, was not an ideal place to recover from trauma, the Imbrans had done their best to make it a sanctuary. The refugee children, along with many peculiar adults who had fled the Whites' campaign of terror, found new homes here. They had founded a new academy, 
where daily lectures and discussions were held, taught by imbrins when they were available, and by peculiar adults with areas of special expertise when they were not. It can be a bit dull sometimes, said Millard, but it's nice to be among scholars. It's only dull because you think you know more than the teachers, said Bronwyn. Well, they aren't. Imbrins, I usually do, he replied, and the Imbrins are nearly almost always busy these days. They were busy, Miss Peregrine said, with a hundred thousand unpleasant tasks most of which had to do with cleaning up after the whites. They left a frightful mess, she said. There was the literal mess, the whites' battle-scarred compound, the loops they had damaged but not quite destroyed. More troublesome was the tide of damaged and compromised people they had left behind, like the ambrosia-addicted peculiars of Devil's Acre. They needed treatment for their addictions, but not all would accept it voluntarily. Then there was the thorny question of who among them could be trusted. Many had collaborated with the whites, some under duress, others willingly, and to a degree that seemed clearly malicious, even treasonous. Trials were required. The peculiar justice system, which had been designed to handle at most a few cases per year, was being rapidly expanded to deal with dozens, most of which had not yet begun. Until they did, the accused sat cooling their heels in the prison call built for the victims of his cruel experiments. And when we aren't dealing with all of that unpleasantness, Miss Peregrine said, the Imbrin Council is holding meetings, meetings all day, meetings into the night. About what? I asked. The future, she replied stiffly. The Council is having its authority challenged, said Millard. Miss Peregrine's expression curdled. Millard went on oblivious. Some people are saying it's time for a change in the way we govern ourselves that the Imbrin system is outmoded, better suited to an earlier era, that the world has changed and we must change with it. Ungrateful sods, Enoch said. Throw them in jail with the traitors, I say. Now, that's exactly wrong, said Miss Peregrine. Imbrins govern by popular consent. Everyone must be allowed to air their ideas even if they are misguided. What do they disagree with you about? I asked. Whether to go on living in loops, for one thing, Emma said. Don't most peculiars have to? I said. Yes, unless we were to attempt a large-scale loop collapse event, said Millard, like the one that reset our internal clocks. That certainly raised some eyebrows. Made people jealous is what it did, said Emma. The things people said to me when they heard we were coming here for a long visit, green with envy. But we could have died in that loop collapse, I said. It's too dangerous. That's true, said Millard. At least until we can understand the loop collapse phenomenon more completely, if we can make proper science out of it, it might be possible to recreate what happened to us safely. But that could take a long time, said Miss Peregrine, and some peculiars are not willing to wait. They're so tired of living in loops, they would risk dying. Absolute madness, said Horace. I had no idea how many muddle brain peculiars there were until we were all thrust into the acre together, cheek by jowl. 
They're not half as crazy as the New World crowd, said Emma, and just the mention of their name made Miss Peregrine sigh. They want to engage with normal society. Don't get me started on, that, on those lunatics, said Enoch. They think the world has become such an open and tolerant place that we could simply come out of hiding. Hello world, we're peculiar and we're proud of it, as if we wouldn't all be burned at the stake, just like old times. They're young, that's all, said Miss Peregrine. They've never lived through a witch hunt or an anti-peculiar panic. Dangerous is what they are, said Horace, picking at his hands anxiously. What if they do something reckless? We ought to jail them too, said Enoch. That's what I think. And that's why you're not on the council, dear, said Miss Peregrine. Now that's quite enough. Politics is the last thing I want to discuss on such a fine day. Here, here said Emma. What am I wearing the swimming costume for if we're not going in the blasted water? Last one in's a rotten egg, Bronwyn shouted and then took off running, which sparked a race for the water's edge. Miss Peregrine and I stood and watched. I had my mind on other things and didn't feel much like swimming, but Miss Peregrine, despite all our talk of trouble and complication, didn't seem weighed down at all. She had a lot on her plate, but her problems, what I knew of them anyway, had to do with growth and healing and freedom, and that was something to be grateful for. Jacob, come and join us, Emma was shouting to me from the water's edge holding up a starfish she'd plucked from the surf. Some of my friends were splashing around in the shallows, but others had dived right in and were swimming. The mm -hmm. gulf in summer was warm as bath water, nothing like the stormy Atlantic that lashed Cairnholm's cliffs. It's magnificent, Millard cried, his body a person-shaped vacuum in the sea. Even Olive was having fun, despite sinking three inches into the, into the sand with every step. Jacob, Emma called, waving me over as she bobbed through a wave. I'm wearing jeans, I called back, which was true, but really, I was happy just observing. There was something so sweet about watching my friends enjoy themselves here. I could feel it melting a patch of ice that had formed over my idea of home. I wanted them to have this whenever they wanted it, this uncomplicated peace, and maybe there was a way they could. I had just figured out how to deal with my parents. It was so simple. I don't know why I hadn't thought of it before. I didn't have to concoct some airtight lie. I didn't need an expertly crafted cover story. Stories could be contradicted and lies could be found out, and even if they weren't, we would constantly have to tiptoe around my parents, always nervous they might see something peculiar, freak out, and blow our uncomplicated piece to bits. What's more, the idea of indefinitely hiding who I was from them sounded exhausting, especially now that my normal and peculiar lives were colliding. But the heart of it was this. My parents weren't bad people. I hadn't been abused or neglected. They just didn't understand me, and I thought they deserved a chance to. So I would tell them the truth. If I revealed it gradually and gently enough, maybe it wouldn't be too traumatic for them. If they met my friends in a calm setting, one by one, and my friends' peculiarities were introduced only after my parents had gotten to know them a bit, maybe it would work. Why not? My dad was a father and son of peculiars. If any normal should be able to understand, it was him. And if my mom was slow to warm up, dad would pull her along. Maybe, then, finally, they would believe me and accept me for who I was. Maybe then we would feel like a real family. I felt a little nervous about suggesting it, 
so I tried to bring it up to Miss Peregrine without the others hearing. Most were still swimming or beachcombing in the shallows. She was being followed by a flock of tiny sandpipers pecking at her ankles with their long beaks. Shoo, she said, sweeping her foot at them as she walked. I'm not your mother. They fluttered off in a wave but kept following. Birds love you, don't they? I said. In Britain, they respect me and my personal space. Here, they seem downright needy. She swept her foot again. Go on, shoo. They skittered into the water. We're due for a chat, yes? I was thinking, what if I just explained everything to my parents? Enoch Millard! Stop that rough housing! She shouted through cupped hands, then turned to me. And we don't wipe their memories. Before I give up on them completely, I'd like to give it one good try. I said, I know it might not work, but if it did, things would be so much easier. I was afraid she would shut me down right away, but she didn't. Not exactly. That would be making a big exception to a long-established rule, she said. There are very few normals who are privy to our secrets. The Imbring Council would have to grant special approval. There's an initiation process, an oath-taking ceremony, a long probationary period. So, you're saying it's not worth it? I'm not saying that at all. Really? I'm only saying it's complex. But in the case of your parents, it could be worth the trouble. What, what could? Horace had come up behind us. So much for keeping this between me and Miss Peregrine. I was thinking about telling my parents the truth about us, I said, to see if they could handle it. What? Why? That was more the reaction I'd been expecting. I think they deserve to know. They tried to have you committed, Enoch said. Now the others were coming out of the water and starting to gather around. I know what they did, I said. But they only did it because they were worried about me. If they had known the truth and were okay with it, they never would have done that. And it would make things so much simpler anytime you guys wanted to come visit or when I want to visit you. You mean you aren't coming back with us? Said Olive. Emma had just arrived dripping seawater and when she heard this, she narrowed her eyes at me. We hadn't talked about this privately yet, but here, I was discussing it with everyone. I'm gonna finish school first, I said. But if I handle this right, we can see one another all the time over the next couple of years. That's a very big if, said Millard. Just imagine, I said. I could come help with the reconstruction efforts, on weekends maybe, and you guys could come here whenever you like and learn about the normal world. You could even go to school with me if you wanted. I glanced at Emma. Her arms were crossed, her face unreadable. Go to school with normals, said Olive. We don't even answer the door when the pizza arrives, said Claire. I'm going to teach you how to deal with them. You'll be experts in no time. This is sounding more far-fetched by the second, said Horace. I just want to give my parents a chance, I said. If it doesn't work... If it doesn't work, Miss P can wipe their memories, said Emma. She walked over to me and threaded her arm through mine. Doesn't it seem tragic that Abe Portman's own son doesn't know who his father was? 
She was on board. I squeezed her arm, grateful for the backup. Tragic, but necessary, said Horace. His parents can't be trusted. No normal can. It makes me nervous just thinking about what they might do. They could expose us all. They wouldn't, I said, though a little voice in my head added, Would they? Why don't we just pretend we're normal when they're around? asked Bronwyn. Then they won't be upset. I really don't think that would work, I said. Some of us don't have the privilege of pretending we're normal, said Millard. I hate pretending anyway, said Horace. How about we just be ourselves and Miss Peregrine can wipe their memories at the end of every day? Too many wipes and people go soft in the head, said Millard, moaning, drooling the whole bit. I looked to Miss Peregrine, who verified this with a quick nod. What if they were to go on holiday somewhere far away? Claire suggested. Miss Keith P could plant the idea in their heads after the wipe, when they're suggestible. And what about after they come back? I said. Then we lock them in the basement. Enoch replied. We should lock you in the basement, said Emma. I was causing everyone stress and anxiety they didn't need. They would worry, I would worry, and all for the sake of my parents, who would cause me nothing but grief for the last six months. I turned to Miss Peregrine. It's too complicated, I said. You should just wipe their memories... If you want to try telling them the truth, I think you should, she replied. I find it's nearly always worth the effort. Really? I said. Are you sure? If it looks like it could work, I'll seek council approval retroactively. If it doesn't, I have a feeling we'll know rather quickly. Fantastic, said Emma. And now that we've got that sorted, she pulled me by the arm toward the water. It's time to swim. And I was caught so off guard that I couldn't stop her. Wait, no, my phone. I rescued it from my jeans pocket just before I fell chest high into the water, then tossed it to Horace back on the shore. Emma splashed me and swam away, and I paddled after her, laughing. I was suddenly wildly happy, happy to be among friends, my eyes dazzled by the sun, paddling after a beautiful girl who liked me, loved me, she'd once said, bliss. Up ahead, Emma had found a sandbar. She stood in waist-high water despite being far from shore. It was a trick of these friendly tides that I had always loved. Why, hello, I said, slightly out of breath, as I planted my feet on the sandbar. Do you always go swimming in blue jeans? She said, grinning. Oh, yeah, everyone does. It's the latest thing. It is not, she said. Seriously, it's called uh, nano denim, and it dries... Five seconds after you get out of the water. Really? That's astounding. It folds itself, too. She squinted at me. You're serious? And it makes you breakfast. She splashed me. It's not nice playing tricks on girls from past centuries. You make it too easy, I said, ducking and then splashing her back. Actually, I was expecting more in the way of flying cars and robot assistants and such. Robot pants, at the very least. Sorry about that. We made the internet instead. 
very disappointing. I know, I'd rather have flying cars. I mean, it's disappointing that you've turned out to be such a liar. I really had high hopes for us. Oh well. I just had to get it out of my system. No more tricking, I promise. You promise, promise? Ask me something else. I promise, promise to tell you the truth. Okay, she grinned, raking wet bangs from her eyes and crossed her arms. Tell me about your first kiss. I felt myself blush and tried sinking into the water to hide it. But of course, I couldn't really because I had to breathe. I walked right into that, didn't I? You know practically every nook and cranny of my romantic history. How is it fair that I don't know anything about yours? Because there's nothing worth knowing. Oh, bunkum. Not even a kiss. I glanced around, hoping for some distraction that might interrupt her line of questioning. Um, I let my mouth sink below the waterline and mumbled something that came out as bubbles. She lay her palms on the surface of the water. After a moment, it began to hiss and steam. Tell me or I'll boil you. I bobbed upward. Okay, okay, I confess. I dated a supermodel rocket scientist and a pair of twins who won a grant for their humanitarian work and exotic lovemaking skills, but you're better than any of them. The steam had briefly obscured her, and when it cleared, she was no longer there. Emma? I panicked, searching the water. Emma? Then a splash came from behind me, and I spun around and got a face full of water. There she was, laughing at me. I said no tricks. You freaked me out, I said, wiping my eyes. You can't expect me to believe that such a handsome young lad never had a single kiss before I came along. Okay, uh, one, I admitted. But it's hardly worth mentioning. I think the girl was like, experimenting on me. Oh my, now that does sound interesting. Her name was Janine Wilkins. She kissed me behind the bleachers during Melanie Shaw's birthday party at the Stardust Skate Center, and she said she was tired of being a kiss virgin and wanted to see what it felt like. Then she swore me to secrecy and said if I told anyone about it, she'd spread a rumor that I still wet the bed. Goodness, what a trollop. That's my whole exciting history. Her eyes got wide, then she lay back in the water and let herself float. The happy chatter of our friends rose and fell beneath the gentle crash of surf. Jacob Portman, pure as the driven snow. I, uh, yeah, I said, feeling awkward. That's a weird way to put it. It's nothing to be ashamed of, you know. I know, I said, though I'm not sure I did. Then, every movie and TV show aimed at teenage guys made it seem like not having lost your virginity by the time you had your driver's license was some kind of personal failure, which I knew was idiotic, but it's hard not to internalize that stuff when you hear it so often. It means you're careful with your heart, she said. I appreciate that. She cocked an eye at me. And I wouldn't worry, in any case. I'm certain it's not. She dragged a finger across the water, a trail of steam chasing it. A permanent condition? Uh, yeah? I said, a little thrill shooting through me. Time will tell, she said, letting her legs sink, then righting herself. She was focused on me in this intense way, studying me as we drifted closer, our hands linking and feet entangling underwater. Before anything else could entangle, we heard shouts and I saw Miss Peregrine and Horace waving us in from the shore.
It's you, said Horace, handing me my phone as I slogged out of the surf. I held it away from my dripping head. Hello? Jacob, your uncles are waking up. Your parents, too, I think. I'll be there in five minutes, I said. Just keep them where they are. I'll try, but hurry, said Hugh. I don't have any more of that dust stuff, and your uncles are mean. And then all of us who could run, ran. Bronwyn carried all of Miss Peregrine, who could walk and fly, but not run, told us to go on ahead, and over my shoulder I watched as she dove into the sea and disappeared beneath the waves. A moment later, her clothes floated to the surface without her, and then she burst out of the water in bird form and flapped over our heads toward my house. Seeing her shapeshift always made me want to clap my hands and shout, but I restrained myself in case any normals were watching and ran on. We arrived at my front door, sweaty, sandy, and panting, but there was no time to clean up. I could hear my uncle's angry voices through the garage door. We had to take care of them first, before old Mrs. Melrose heard and called the cops. As soon as we got inside, I went to the garage and began apologizing to my uncles. They were angry and confused and starting to get belligerent, and after a minute they barged past me into the house. Miss Peregrine was waiting in the hall with her feather and her penetrating stare, and soon both uncles were calm, quiet, and as pliable as Play-Doh. Their minds were so easy to wipe it was almost disappointing. In the dopey, highly suggestible state that followed, Miss Peregrine let me do the talking. I sat them on the counter stools in the kitchen and explained that the last 24 hours had been totally uneventful that my mental health was beyond reproach, and that all the recent family drama was the result of a misdiagnosis on the part of my new psychiatrist. Just to be on the safe side, I told them that any strange British people they might run into over the next few weeks, or speak to on the phone if they called the house, were distant relatives on my dad's side, and they had come to pay respects to my dear departed grandfather. Uncle Bobby replied with hypnotizing with hypnotized nods. Uncle Les kept muttering, Mm-hmm, while filling his pockets with scrambled eggs from the leftover scraps of breakfast. I told them to go get some sleep, called them taxis, and sent them home. Then it was time to deal with my parents. I asked Bronwyn to carry them upstairs to their bedroom before the sleep dust wore off so they wouldn't wake up in a wrecked car surrounded by reminders of the previous night's trauma. She left them in their bed and closed the door, and for a minute I paced the hall outside, leaving sandy footprints on the carpet, nervously trying to figure out what to say. Emma came up the stairs. Hey, she whispered, before you go in, I wanted you to know something. I went to her and she clasped my hand. Yeah? She fancied you. Who? Janine Wilkins. A girl doesn't lose her kiss virginity to just anyone, you know. I... Uh, my brain was trying and failing to be in two very different places at once. You're messing with me, right? She laughed and looked down. I mean, she did, but yes. I just came to wish you good luck. Not that you need it. You've got this. Thanks. We're right downstairs. Should you need anything... I nodded, and then I kissed her. She smiled and slipped back down the stairs. They woke up gently in their own bed, sun laddering through the shutters. I watched them from a chair in the corner, nibbling my fingernails and trying to stay calm. My mom opened her eyes first. She blinked, rubbed them, 
sat up and groaned and massaged her neck. She had no idea she'd been sleeping in a car for 18 hours. It would make anybody sore. Then she saw me and her brow furrowed. Honey, what are you doing here? I, uh, I, I just wanted to explain some things. Then she looked down at herself, noticed that the clothes she was wearing were the same she'd been wearing last night. A confused look stole over her face. What time is it? About three, I said. Everything's okay. No, she said, looking around the room, confusion turning to panic. I stood up. She pointed at me. Stay there. Mom, don't freak out. Let me explain. She looked away, ignored me, as if maybe I weren't really there. Frank! She shook my father away. Frank! Mm -hmm. He rolled over. She shook harder. Franklin! This was it. My last opportunity. The moment I'd been readying myself for. I had run through a few different approaches in my mind, but they all sounded ridiculous to me now. Too blunt. Too dumb. Just as my dad sat up and began to rub the sleep from his eyes, I all but lost my nerve, suddenly convinced I didn't have the right words. It didn't matter. Ready or not, it was showtime. Mom, Dad, there's something I need to talk to you about. I walked to the foot of their bed and started talking. I can hardly remember what it was I said, only that I felt like a door-to-door -door salesman whose pitch was bombing. I tried to explain how my grandfather's last words and his strange snapshots and the postcard from Miss Peregrine had led me to discover the Peculiar's house, and in it all of Abe's old friends, who were not only still alive, they weren't even old. But I found myself dancing around terms like time loop and powers because it just seemed like it was too soon, too much. My clumsily censored version of the truth combined with jitters seemed only to confirm to them that I was out of my mind. And the more I talked, the more they inched away from me, my mom drawing the comforter up around her shoulders and my dad scooting back against the headboard, that vein that popped out from his forehead where he, when he was stressed, dancing a jig, as if whatever mania was in me might be contagious. Just stop, my mom shouted, finally interrupting me. I can't listen to any more of this. But it's true, and if you'd only hear me out, she threw the covers back and leapt out of bed. We've heard enough, and we already know what happened. You were torn up about your grandpa. You secretly quit taking your medication. She was pacing, angry. We sent you halfway around the world at the worst possible time on the advice of a quack and you had a breakdown. It's nothing for you to be ashamed of, but we have had to deal with this honestly, okay? You can't just keep hiding behind these stories. I felt like I'd been slapped. You won't even give me a chance. We've given you a hundred, my dad said. No, you never believe me. Well, of course we don't, my mom said. You're a lonely boy who lost someone important. And then you meet these kids who are special, just like your grandpa was, and only you can see them. It doesn't take a PhD to diagnose. You've been making up imaginary friends since you were two. I didn't say I was the only one who could see them, I said. You met them last night in the driveway. Both my parents looked, for an instant, like they'd seen a ghost. Maybe they had blocked what happened last night from their minds. That can happen sometimes, when an isolated event so thoroughly disagrees with a person's concept of reality. What are you talking about? My mom said, her voice quivering. 
it seemed there was nothing left to do but introduce them to my friends. Do you want to meet them? I said. Again? Jacob, said my father, his tone a warning. They're here, I said. I promise they aren't dangerous. Just be cool, okay? I opened the door and brought Emma into the room. She had gotten as far as, Hi, Mr. and Mrs. Portman, when my mom screamed. Mrs. Peregrine and Bronwyn ran in. What's the matter? Miss Peregrine said. My mom shoved her, actually shoved Miss Peregrine. Get out! Get out! I saw Bronwyn restrain herself from grabbing my mom and throwing her into a wall. Mary Ann, calm down! My dad shouted. They're not going to hurt you, I said. I tried to grab her by the shoulders, but she wrenched out of my grip and sprinted from the room. Mary Ann, my dad shouted again, but when he tried to run after her, Bronwyn grabbed him by the arms. He was too groggy from the dust to fight her. I chased my mom down the stairs. She ran into the kitchen and grabbed a carving knife. The other peculiars came out of hiding, and as she stood with her back against the refrigerator, waving the knife, they ranged around her, just out of stabbing range. Calm down, Mrs. Portman, Emma said. We don't mean you any harm. <laughs> Get away from me, my mom screamed. Oh, God. Oh, God. Maybe it was Olive crawling toward her along the ceiling. She grabbed a fishing net from the garage and meant to drop it on my mom, or Millard's voice shouting from what seemed like a floating bathrobe. And, but finally, my mom just fainted. The knife clattered to the tile floor, and she slumped down next to it, a sight so pathetic I had to look away. I could hear my dad shouting from upstairs. He was calling my mom's name. It must have sounded like we'd killed her. We've got her. Emma said to me, go to your father. Yeah. <laughs> I stepped on the drop knife and slid it under a cabinet, just in case my mom came too. Emma, Horace, Hugh, and Millard lifted her and carried her toward the couch. There was nothing more I could do, so I ran upstairs. My dad was crouched in the corner of the bedroom, clutching a pillow. Bronwyn stood guard in the doorway with her arms spread, ready to catch him if he tried to run. When my dad saw me, his expression turned to ice. Where is she? He said. What did they do to her? Mom's okay, I said. She's sleeping now. He was shaking his head. She'll never get over this. She will. Miss Peregrine has the power to take away certain memories. She won't remember. And your uncles? I nodded. Same for them. Miss Peregrine came in. Mr. Portman, how do you do? My dad ignored her, kept his eyes locked on me. How could you? He spat the words. How could you bring these people into our house? They came to help me, I said, to convince you I wasn't insane. You can't do this to people. He was talking to Miss P now. Blaze into their lives. Scare the hell out of everyone. Erase whatever you want. It isn't right. It seems the truth is more than your wife can handle, for the time being, anyway, Miss Peregrine said. But Jacob was very much hoping that wouldn't be the case for you. He stood up slowly, let his hands drop to his sides. He looked resigned, resentful. 
Well then, I guess you'd better lay it on me. I turned to look at Miss Peregrine. You'll be okay, I nodded. We'll be right outside, she said, and she and Bronwyn went out, closing the door behind them. I talked for a long time. I sat on the edge of the bed and my dad sat in the chair in the corner, his eyes low and shoulders slumped like a child enduring a lecture. I didn't let his manner bother me. I told my story from the beginning and this time I was calm. I told him what I'd found on the island, how I had met the children and who they turned out to be how I discovered I was one of them. I even told them about the Hologast. Although I didn't go into the complexities of what came after, the battles we fought, or the Library of Souls, or Miss Peregrine's evil brothers, it was enough, for now, that he know who his father was, and who I was. When I finished, he hadn't spoken in several minutes. He didn't look afraid anymore. He just looked sad. Well, I said. I should have known, he said, the way you and your grandpa got along. Like you had a secret language. He was nodding gently to himself. I should have known. I think part of me did know. What do you mean? You knew about Grandpa, but not about me? Yes. No. Well, hell, I don't know. He was staring past me, hard like he was trying to see through fog. I guess... Deep down, I knew. But I never wanted to believe it. I inched towards the edge of the bed. He told you? I think he tried to, once, but I must have blocked it out, or somehow someone stole the memory from me. But last night, he tapped his forehead, seeing those people jog something loose in my brain. Now it was his turn to talk and mine to listen. I was around 10 when it happened. Your grandfather would go on these long business trips. He'd be awake for weeks at a time. I always wanted to go with him, and I used to beg and plead, but he always, always said no. Until one day, one day, he said yes. My father stood up and began pacing, as if just remembering this was giving him nervous energy to burn. We drove up to, I don't remember exactly, North Florida or Georgia. We picked up an associate of his along the way. I knew him. He'd been by the house a time or two. Black guy. Always had a cigar in his mouth. Abe called him H. Just H. Anyway, he'd been real friendly the other times I'd met him, but this time he had a weird energy and he kept looking at me. And a couple of times I heard him say to my dad, you sure about this? Anyway, it got dark and we stopped for the night, some ratty old motel. And then in the middle of the night, my dad wakes me up and he's scared. He says, Frank, get your things. And he rushes me out to the car. I'm still in my pajamas, and now I'm scared, because nothing frightened my dad. Nothing. Well, we tear out of that parking lot like zombies are chasing us, but we don't get more than a couple of blocks before the car goes, woof, and it just lurches, like something hit us from the side, only there were no other cars around. And then dad hits his brakes and throws it in the park and jumps out. 
He says, get down, Frank. Stay out of sight. But I can't look away. And the next thing I know, he gets yanked up into the air by something I can't see. And he starts making these awful noises in his throat. And he drops back down to earth. And he's still making those god-awful sounds like an animal in his eyes. I can see him in the headlights of the car. His eyes are rolled back in his head, all light. And his clothes are all stained with this black crud. And I get out of the car and start running right into this cornfield and I don't look back. I think I must have passed out at some point because the next thing I remember is I'm back in a motel room bed and there's my dad and H and two or three other people and they're so strange looking. They're all covered in dirt and blood and the smell. God, the smell. And one of them, I'll never forget, he's got no face at all. Just a mask of skin and I'm so scared. Too scared to even scream. And dad's saying, it's okay, Frankie, don't be scared. This lady's gonna talk to you now, don't be scared. And this woman, she looked kinda like her. At some point, Miss Peregrine had cracked the door and leaned into the room and my dad gestured to her. She did something to me so that the next day the memories were barely there anymore. Like it was just a bad dream. And my dad never, ever spoke about it after that. She was supposed to wipe your memories. Miss Peregrine said. It seems she didn't quite finish the job. I wish to God she had, my dad said. I had nightmares for years. For a while, I thought I was really losing it. My dad told her not to get rid of my memories completely. Kind of a sadistic thing to do to a kid, don't you think? But part of him wanted me to know. It was like a, a blackboard that had been wiped, but if you squinted hard enough, you could still read it a little. But I didn't want to see it. I didn't want to know. Because I really, really did not want that to be true about my father. That he was like that. You just wanted a normal father, I said. Right, said my dad, as if finally I had understood. Well, he wasn't, I said, and neither am I. So it would seem. He stopped pacing and sat on the edge of the bed, his body angled away from mine. Your son is a brave and gifted young man, Miss Peregrine said icily. You should be very proud of him. My father muttered something. I asked him what he'd said. He looked up, and there was a look in his eyes now that hadn't been there a moment ago. It was something like loathing. You made a choice? It wasn't a choice, I said. It's who I am. No. You chose them. You chose these people over us. It doesn't have to be like that. Either or, we can coexist. Tell that to your mother, screaming like a lunatic. Tell that to your uncles who are, where? What did you do to them? They're fine, Dad. Nothing is fine. He bellowed, jumping to his feet again. You've destroyed everything. Miss Peregrine had been lingering at the door, but now stormed into the room, Bronwyn close behind her. Sit down, Mr. Portman. 
No, I will not live in a madhouse. I will not subject my family to this insanity. This could work, I said. I'm telling you. He came at me in a rush, and I thought for a moment he might hit me. But he stopped short. I made my choice, Jacob, a long time ago. And now it looks like you've made yours. We were chest to chest, my father red-cheeked and breathing hard. I'm still your son, I whispered. His jaw was set, but I saw his lip tremble as if he were about to speak. Then he turned away and went to the chair and sat again, his head in his hands. It was silent in the room for a moment, the only sounds as uneven, mm -hmm. hitching breaths. Finally, I said, Tell me what you want. He raised his head without looking at me, pressed a finger to his temple. Go ahead, he said hoarsely. Wipe it. That's what you were going to do anyway. I felt a sudden desperation. Not if you don't want us to. Not if you think... No, it's what I want, he said, looking to Miss Peregrine. Only this time. Finish the job. He sat back in the chair, limp and the light seemed to go out of his eyes. Miss Peregrine looked at me. I could feel myself going numb, head to toe. I nodded at her, and then I left the room. Emma stopped me as I was rushing down the stairs. Are you okay? I didn't hear what happened. I'm fine, I said. I was not, but I did not yet know how to talk about it. Jacob, please talk to me. Not now, I said. I needed very badly to be alone. More specifically, I needed to scream out the window of a fast-moving car until my breath gave out. She let me go. I didn't look back. I didn't want to see the look on her face. I ran past my mother, crumpled on the couch, and my friends in a nervous, whispering cluster. I snatched the car keys from the wooden bowl on the kitchen counter, went into the garage, and slapped the door button. The garage made a painful, grinding whine as it tried to open, but the car's rear bumper was so badly wedged into it that it would not, and a moment later it gave up and went silent. I swore and kicked the closest thing to me as hard as I could. It happened to be a boxy old TV stashed under the garage workbench. My shoeless foot went through the back of it and shards of plastic went flying, my foot now numb and probably cut. I extracted it roughly and limped out the side door into the yard and screamed at the trees. The knot of boiling anger in my chest shrank a little. I rounded into the backyard, crossed the grass, and walked down our little sun-warped dock that jutted into the bay. My parents didn't own a boat, not even a canoe. I only ever used the dock for one thing, sitting on the end with my feet dangling into the brown water, thinking about unpleasant things, which is what I did now. After a minute or two, I heard footsteps coming down the planks. I was ready to turn and bark at whoever it was to please to go to hell, but then the slightly uneven gait gave her away, and I couldn't bring myself to be rude to Miss Peregrine. Watch out for nails, I said without turning. Thank you, she replied. May I sit? I kept my eyes on the water, shrugged, a boat puttered by in the distance. It's done, she said. Your parents are in a suggestible state now. 
ready for input. I need to know what you'd like me to tell them. I don't care. A few seconds passed. She sat down on the dock beside me. When I was your age, she said, I tried something similar with my parents. Miss Peregrine, I really don't feel like talking right now. So, listen. Sometimes Miss Peregrine couldn't be argued with. I had been away in Miss Avocet's Imbrin Academy for a few years, she began, when it occurred to me that I still had a mother and father, and it would please me to see them again. Because some considerable time had passed since I'd gotten my wings and began rather unceremoniously driven from my home, I thought they might see me in a different light as a person and a daughter, rather than some loathsome aberration. I found them living in a hovel on the outskirts of our village. They had been shunned because of me. Even our relations refused to associate with them. Everyone believed they were consorts of the devil. I tried to win them over. They still loved me, but they feared me even more. It ended with my mother cursing the day I was born, and my father chasing me from the house with an iron from the fire. Years later, I heard they had died, sewed stones into their pockets, and walked into the sea. She sighed. A breeze whisked up, carrying away the stagnant summer heat for a moment. It hardly seemed possible that the world she was describing could exist alongside this one. I'm sorry that happened to you, I said. Our blood relationships often don't survive the truth, she replied. I thought about that for a moment, and then I got annoyed. That's not what you said an hour ago. You said the truth is worth the trouble, or something. She shifted uncomfortably, brushing sand from the hem of her dress. I thought I should let you try. Why? I said, my voice starting to rise. It's not my place to tell you how to be a son to your parents. As far as I'm concerned, I don't have parents. Don't say that, she said. I know they said terrible things to you, but you can't. I stood up suddenly and jumped into the water. I held my breath and stayed down, hoping the blackness and the sudden chill would blot out my thoughts. He doesn't want to know you. He chose oblivion rather than knowing you. And then I screamed into the muddy depths until I ran out of breath. And when I surfaced again, maybe 20 feet from the dock, Miss Peregrine was on her feet, about to dive in after me. Jacob, are you? I'm fine. I'm fine, I said. The water was so shallow that I could easily touch the bottom. I told you I didn't feel like talking. That you did she said. She stood on the dock, and I stood in the bay up to my waist, my feet sinking into the mud while little fish nibbled at my legs. I'm going to say something, she said, and you aren't allowed to throw a tantrum in response. Fine. 
I know you don't like it much right now, but I promise you will regret throwing this normal life away. What life? I've got no friends here. My parents are afraid and ashamed of me. They are alive, which is more than most of us can say. And as of five minutes ago, they don't remember any of what just happened. Well, I do, and I'm not interested in pretending I'm someone I'm not for the rest of my life. If that's the price of being their son, it's not worth it. She looked as if she wanted to shout something at me, but then swallowed it back. I never claimed being peculiar was easy, she said after a moment. There are many unpleasant and difficult things about being one of us. Learning how to negotiate a world of people who can't understand you and don't want to. That's probably the hardest bit. Many find it impossible and retreat into loops, but I never saw that for you. You've got a very special talent, and I don't mean your facility with Hollowgast. You're a shape-shifter of sorts, Jacob, able to move easily between worlds. You were never meant to be tied to just one home or one family. You'll have many, like your grandfather did. I looked up as a pelican sailed overhead, each wing beat a little sigh, and imagined my grandfather's life. He had lived most of it in a crappy little house on the edge of a swamp. His wife and kids hardly knew him. He risked his life year after year, fighting for the peculiar cause. And his reward in the end was to be treated like a senile old crank. I don't want to be like my grandfather. I don't want his life. You won't. You'll have your own. What about school? I don't think you're listening to me. I don't want. I turned around, flung my arms wide, screamed it across the water. Any of this shit. I turned back to her, face flushing. Are you quite finished? She said. Yes, I said quietly. Good. Now that I'm fully briefed on all the things you don't want, what do you want? I want to do something to help the only people in the world who ever truly gave a damn about me? Peculiars. And I want to do something important. Something big. All right, then. She crouched down and extended her hand. You can start right now. I waded over, and she hoisted me up onto the dock. I have a job that's absolutely critical, and that no one in peculiarum can do but you, Miss Peregrine was saying as we walked. Okay, what is it? The children need contemporary outfits. I need you to take them shopping. Shopping? 
I started, I stopped walking. You've got to be kidding. She turned to face me. Her expression was flat. I am not. I said I want to do something important in the peculiar world. She moved in close, her voice low and intense. I've said it before, but it bears repeating. It is imperative to the future of that world that these children understand how to navigate this one. And there is no one but you to teach them, Jacob. Who else? The ones who've been living in loops for decades know nothing of it. They couldn't manage a modern-day street crossing. And the ones who haven't lived in loops are either very old or so young and new to our peculiar world that they're but neophytes themselves. She grabbed my shoulders in her hands and squeezed them. I know. I know you're angry and want to leave, but I beg you, just stay a little longer. I think I know a way for you to exist here, only sometimes, whenever you like, while also doing important work with us in the loops. Yeah, I said skeptically. What is it? Give me until... She fished her pocket watch from her pants and glanced at it. Until night falls. Then you'll see. Satisfactory. My first thought was that it had something to do with the Panlupticon in Devil's Acre. But the closest loop, the one they'd used to get here last night, was hours away in the middle of a swamp. And anyway, I didn't want to come and go like a commuter. I wanted to leave all of this behind. To go and stay gone. But Miss Peregrine was hard to say no to, and I had agreed to help my friends learn something about the present. I didn't feel right reneging on that promise outright. Fine, I said. Tonight. Excellent. She was about to go when she said, Oh, before I forget, and pulled an envelope out of her other pocket, and handed it to me to cover the shopping. I peeked inside. It was stuffed with $50 bills. Will that be sufficient? Ah, uh, I think so. She nodded smartly and started toward the house, leaving me stunned with the envelope in my hand. Much to do, much to do. She was muttering, and then she called over her shoulder, jabbing a finger into the air. Tonight! And that is the end of chapter two. Big chapter. Heavy chapter. I'm glad we got all the way through it, because I really didn't want to stop on that one. Because I knew it was going to be a pretty... Pretty heavy... <laughs> It's, I think it highly representative of certain households, in, like, because anybody who has ever had to have the, like, coming out of the closet sort of discussion with your parents and it did not go well, will resonate with that scene. heavy heavy and so i was and and the, the it does a good a really good rendition of that exact conflict with not having anything like that be the subject of it but that just as far as i'm concerned i don't have parents that kind of response is very authentic for like that kind of interaction that 
that whole scene, the when I first read it, got me. I was worried I would cry today. I was really worried about it. <laughs> oh. See, yeah, that's heavy. I made someone I made you cry? Oh my god. I'm so sorry. That's <laughs> That wasn't what I wanted to do. Oh. See, and that's hard. When you have, like, a family member that... And it's almost like a blessed mercy for them. In, like, a weird way. And it's also sort of a curse. And it just... In that manner of when you really kind of hold out hope that this is going to go well. Oh, thank you for the heart. Um, I know. That's the worst bit of it, isn't it? I'm sure it has made your relationship better. And that's... Those conversations are hard. And it does a really good job of introducing a conflict like that with your own parents. Because I, as a person who has had their parents say renditions of that, that they wish they didn't know me or anything like that. If you've ever had a conversation like that with your parents, my heart goes out to you. I know how difficult that is. And that is a really good example of that. That is digestible by children and not of, um, and like it's completely fictional. And so there, you can't claim that the book is super political. There's no inherently out or gay characters in there. There's certainly some that are queer coded, but <laughs> we don't have to talk about that. But you know what I mean. Like it's not. It's a easily digestible conflict that would make sense to a child. That would also make sense if you're not a child and you have had that level of conversation with your parents that ends up in such in a disappointing way. And disappointing isn't even the correct word. Because it's so far beyond disappointing. If there was just a graduated word for disappointed, no other word has the exact same connotation. Devastated, sure, but doesn't relay the message. It's hard to describe the feeling that that gives you. And that chapter does a really good job, in particular to me, of recreating that conflict. And so for anybody else who resonated with that scene, if that hit you hard, my heart goes out to you. Because it hit me hard too. <laughs> oh, see, that's always unfortunate. Yeah, gutted. For sure. I'm out of water. I was really worried I would. <laughs> I drank a lot of it at the beginning. Too fast. Too fast. And there were no pictures in there. Oh, God. Oh, that's Dad. <laughs> Dad's over here. Um, Well, now that we've all had like the most gut-wrenching chapter that we could possibly have. Who wants cat facts really quick before we go? <sighs> All right. We're going to be covering the Berman breed today. Like many other cat breeds, the Burman cat, not to be confused with the Burmese cat, was first thought was first brought to Europe and officially recognized during colonial times in a faraway nation. Myanmar, also known as Burma, was occupied by the British when the sacred cat of Burma, named the Burman cat, after the French word for Burmese, was first introduced in the French version of Cat Fanciers Association. Most of the suggested origin stories seemed like romantic myths, featuring Burmese temples and daring smugglers. During World War II, Burman cats were so concentrated in only Europe that the entire breed almost died out. 
breeders had to use one surviving pair of cats and continue crossbreeding with similar cats until they had a new line of Burman cats, and the breed was recognized beginning in the 1960s. The Burman Cat's evocative name and mythical origins have given this breed an air of mystery and exoticism, but Burman Cats look similar to other color point breeds like Siamese Cats. Their special feature is that they have white gloves over their dark pointed paws, and they have both solid and tabby colorations. A tabby point cat has the same dark face and feet, but these areas are also striped. Their delicate facial features and special coloration can make Burman cats seem dainty. But really, Burmans are well-built and strong. Their frames are large and sturdy, and their fluffy coats resist matting. Besides being beautiful, Burman cats are sweet, healthy, and vigorous. A perfect Burman cat has white gloves that match one pair in front and one pair in back. In reality, almost none are this symmetrical, and their white gloves are charming, no matter their length. And there's little kitty. Look at that baby. Look at that baby. Who's the cutest little baby? <laughs> Well, that was a whole journey for us. Um, I hope you enjoyed the chapter. We do this every week. And we're going to be back here next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Central doing the same exact thing, chapter 3 this time. And I hope you all will join us. And if not, no worries. But thanks for showing up today. And we're going to move right into the game stream right after this. I stream on Discord. I'm going to be playing Binding of Isaac. You're never going to believe this. Once I boot it up, I'm going to tell you what the happened yesterday. But that is for later. And I will see you in a few minutes or I'll see you next week. Thank you all for coming.